Genesis chapter 22. Uh, two weeks ago, we started talking about the concept of worship, and uh, we started off by teaching that worship, it's the reason for salvation. That doesn't mean that any other uh, benefits of salvation is unimportant. Simply put, uh, we were created to worship, and we can't do so when we're lost, and so the redemption plan we saw throughout the Old Testament he said to the people of Israel who had uh, turned away from him that one day he would be able to redeem them in such a way that they could worship him. And then we saw in the New Testament that same passages that were in the Old Testament, Paul referred to them as he's talking to the Gentile church in Corinth uh, regarding this thing of worship. And so we were worshipped, it, its, its purpose or its reason, it's the reason why we were saved. Then last week, we talked about, without going into detail of review, because we've got a lot of territory to cover today, but we said worship. It's the true sign of a, it's the sign of a true believer. If you're saved, uh, then you, and we're going to see this more, I think, next week, uh, but if you're saved, there ought to be something in you where you have a desire to worship. I mean, the Holy Spirit took up residence. Now, it is possible that a person can become cold-hearted. It is possible that a person, in fact, we were just talking before service, uh, Mrs. Henson, myself, my daughter, and so forth, regarding you know a, a person who just gets saved, they don't necessarily understand uh, a lot of things they need to understand, and discipleship is very important to help them. But even then, the Holy Spirit works in their heart and so forth to lead them down a certain path or to teach them uh, right from wrong, and a lot of times they might not understand why the things they used to do, they feel weird about doing it. And uh, without guidance, sometimes they might miss, miss the opportunity. So it is possible, I suppose, that someone could be saved and there is that desire in them to worship. But because no one themselves or anyone else flammed the flames, it just becomes embers. And, uh, and therefore they don't. So you might say, well, you know, I, I got saved, but I don't feel like worshiping. Well, maybe, maybe you just got some embers there. You're still saved, uh, but you need to fan those flames, you know. But I, I promise you, if you are, if your, if your flames are are burning, uh, as a as a, a very poor illustration, I guess. But I promise you, if if your heart is where it should be and you're saved, you're going to want to worship. Now, uh, we're going to talk today about this subject of worship. It's the adoration of God, and I made a statement a few times, I think, in the previous weeks, and I'll make that statement probably often today. Um, and that is, I think that we've got this idea of worship quite skewed, uh, at least in American churches. I, don't, I can't speak for other churches. Uh, you know, for instance, church, you know what I feel about praise. I just finished preaching three weeks on, on, on praising the Lord. And, and I believe that we ought to be a people of praise, singing, shouting, all that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, and I believe it's a travesty in, in, doctrinally sound churches that lost their praise. I mean, if anything, they ought to be praising more than all the, you know, the, the churches that have no no sound doctrine. But but here's the thing. There's been a confusion between worship and praise. Praise is a part of worship, but it is not the main thing in worship. In fact, many of the churches that I know of uh, that have, you know, their praise and worship service, and it's basically a uh, uh, a rock concert per to uh, Christian type words and so forth. Uh, what they do, they're calling it worship, but but it's really not. It's more appealing to the flesh than it is to the spirit. And uh, and so we get confused sometimes as to what worship actually is. Praise is a part of worship, but praise is a, is just a part. Of, you ought to praise, but don't assume because you're praising that that's necessarily worship. It's it's part of it, but it's not completely. So I'm already giving you the answer to the question, what is worship? It's the adoration of God. And uh, we're going to look at a lot of things now. I'm going to warn you, uh, whether you're online or whether you're here, there's a big portion of this lesson that 
I'm risking the chance of causing you to have your eyes glass over and lose you. You're going to have to pay attention on purpose because I'm going to take you through a series of definitions that I know some people, you know, they get tired of hearing definitions, but unless you know what words mean, you could be completely off on what you're saying. And, uh, and, I, and I, there's a purpose that I'm going to take you down this path. As I was studying last night and my notes got getting bigger and bigger and bigger, I thought, I don't know, this may be going a little bit too too in depth, too deep, and so forth. But so I might cut it down. I don't know, but I just know where I'm planning on going now. But let's go ahead and start off in Genesis chapter 22. Uh, first, I'm going to pray, and then I'll have you look at the scripture with me. Father, we love you. Thank you for your blessings today. Thank you for those who could be here, those that are on their way, those that would join us in the next service and whatnot. Uh, Father, I pray for safe travels. I, I ask that you help us teach us today what what r worship truly is. Uh, give us a heart. I pray. To adore you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Genesis chapter 22. You're familiar with the story. This is Abraham and his son uh, heading up on the mountaintop to sacrifice. And, uh, and we'll pick it up at verse 4. This is Genesis chapter 22, verse 4. It says, Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now, I'm going to be breaking down the use of the word worship throughout the Bible, but I just want to point out this is the very first time that any word that deals with worship is mentioned, whether we're talking about worship, worshiping, worshipeth, worshipped, you know, whatever. This is the very first time that English word worship is used. And, um, and, I, and I want to ask you a question. Do you... I, and you know the answer to the question, but did Abraham know what he was about to do or what he thought he was about to do? Did he know? Which was what? To sacrifice his son. And he says to the young lad that was with him or the young men that was with him, abide ye here. This is verse five with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and what? And worship and come again to you now there is an interesting caveat there i believe that abraham had faith the book of uh, romans i believe it is tells us that abraham believed that god would raise his son from the dead he didn't know that god was going to replace his son he just uh, with a with a sacrifice he believed that god would raise his son from the dead and somehow or another he believed that they would come back but nonetheless we're going to worship now abraham knows that this means i'm going to sacrifice my son right now, we're going to read on a little bit more, and, and I'll get to the questions for you. Verse 6, And Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife. What's the next four words? To slay his son. This was not, a, this was not going through the motions. You understand Abraham had every intention to plunge that knife into his son or to slit his throat as you might do with a sacrifice, causing the blood to spit out on the altar. Whatever the case may be, he had every intention of killing his son because he was told by God, offer me your son, your only son, Isaac. Now, he believed. Now, at some point, he did tell, Ab he did tell Isaac, well, God will provide himself a lamb, okay, and, and he, he'll, he'll take care of it. But we also know, as I already mentioned, and I believe it's Romans, where we, we learn this thing of faith that Abraham, or it might have been Hebrews. Yeah, in fact, it was Hebrews. That he believed, Hebrews chapter 11, he believed that God would raise his son from the dead because God said Isaac was the one that was going to be used to make the great nation. He can't do that if he's dead. God told me to kill him. I don't have to understand how he's going to do it. I'm just going to, by faith, obey God. I'm going to kill my son. But God's still going to keep his promise, so he must plan on raising him from the dead, which may I point out, at least recorded in Scripture, no one has ever been risen from the dead yet at this point. Yet Abraham's faith allowed him to obey, even though it seemed to contradict everything, trusting that God had a plan that he couldn't understand. Now, we know, hindsight, what that plan was. 
Abraham was stopped. It was a test. There's a ram in the bushes and all was well. Praise God. But Abraham did not know that. And Abraham said to the young men, we're going to go to worship. And so, again, this is the first time of 198 times that you'll find any of the following words in your Bible. Worship, worshipped, worshipping, worshippers, or worshipper, worshipeth. I mean, if you take the word worship and every inclination of it, you find that word 198 times in your Bible. This is the first time you find it. And so what do we learn in regards to that word from this phrase? I'll start you off because I am looking for you to give me some suggestions. I've written down one, two, three, four, five. And you might say one of mine or you might come up with your own. But as we read that passage of what Abraham is about to do, and he calls it worship, what can we learn about worship? And the very first one I wrote down is sacrifice. Okay, And when I say sacrifice, I don't just mean a sacrifice, but sacrificing your stuff. You follow me? It, it, it's a sacrifice. To sacrifice for him is worship. Can anyone else give me a word? Obedience. That is my fourth word. Obedience. Worship. You say, well, I love to worship God. Then that means you're going to obey him. You, you worship him through obedience. You worship him through sacrifice. It's not about, you know, this, uh, this get rich quick mentality that modern church is teaching and so forth. Uh, worship is about sacrifice, not what I get, but what I give. OK, what's another word that you can think of? Yes, ma'am. Faith. That is not why well, I have a word similar to that. That's a good one, though. Worship is a is an act of faith. Yes. Praise. Well, not from this passage. I don't see it. But yes, we've talked about that. Praise is a part of worship. What's that? Trust. That's the word I wrote down that matches her faith. Uh, faith word. Anything else? Yes. Submission. That's good. I didn't have that one. So I'll have to write that for future lessons. And uh, so I can claim it as my own. But uh, submission. So I'll go ahead and move on. I also have uh, an offering, which would be similar to the sacrifice side of type of things. And, and then this is what I, 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 I finished my list with. Basically, worship is putting God first. I mean, he's willing to give up his only son. Ishmael is not counted in this equation for various reasons. And so as God is concerned, he's, he's willing to give up his only son. He, in other words, whatever God wants, he gets. God comes first in my life. Don't claim to be a worshiper of God if you can't put God first in your life. And so as we move on, the question is, well, what is worship? What is worship? Well, if you look at the 1828 Noah Webster Dictionary, uh, you'll find three, defini uh, three categories of definitions. One is a noun, which we're not going to talk about because we're not talking about a noun. One is a transitive verb and one is an intransitive verb. And I won't go into detail of what that means. We'll just call them verbs. But basically, worship means to adore. It means to pay divine honors to. It means to reverence with supreme respect and veneration. And as an example, Mr. Repser gives us Exodus 34, thou shalt worship no other God. We should adore no other God. We should uh, not pay any honor to any other God. We should not reverence any other God. We should not show supreme respect to any other God or any type of veneration to any other God. And just so we're clear, when I say any other God, I don't necessarily just mean statues. I don't necessarily mean Baal or Buddha or whatever. I'm talking about anything in your life that is a God to you, whether it be your job, whether it be sports, whether it be some sort of other item, whether it be your car, nothing should get more adoration than God. The second definition he gives under this is to respect or to honor, to treat with civil reverence. The third definition he gives is to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission as a lover. And the example he gives is this phrase, with bended knees, I daily worship her. So this idea of honoring with extravagant love. I believe that we ought to love one another, and I believe husbands and wives ought to show deep affectionate love to each other and all that. But my question is, how often do you show extravagant love to God? Because that's what worship is. The 
the uh, the other verb is to of worship is to perform, to perform acts of adoration or to perform religious service as in John 4 the woman at the well said to Jesus our fathers worshiped in this mountain meaning they performed their religious services there in that mountain now when it comes to the word worship if you were to do a word study or a search on it in the old testament that word worship is found 118 times in 115 verses. And no, we're not going to look at all those verses. In fact, we're going to look at very few of them. Uh, the, the Hebrew worship, most of the time, will be the word shaka. And uh, in fact, that word shaka is found 193 times in your Bible, 99 times of which is some form of worship. And the word means to depress. Not to be depressed, but to depress. Or that is to prostrate, especially reflexively in homage to royalty or God. In other words, if you were to be in uh, a court, not a court, well, okay, we'll use a courtroom as an example. You're in a courtroom and the judge enters and the bailiff says what? All rise. rise. And what do you do? You stand. And if you don't, you could actually be held in contempt of court unless you are physically unable to do so. And we call him your honor because the position he's in is a position of honor. But even better example is if you were in the courtroom of a king and the king were to enter into your presence, your immediate reflexive action is what? To bow. To go to your knee and to look down and not look up at him until he tells you otherwise. That's what worship is, a reflexive action of bowing prostrate down, to bow oneself down, to crouch, to fall down flat, to humbly beseech, to do obeisance, to do reverence, to make, to stoop, or to worship. In fact, as you look at this word shaka that is translated uh, uh, 99 times as some form of worship, uh, there are a few other ways it's translated that I think helps us to understand the word worship a little bit better. And so I want you to consider those. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 36. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 36. This will give us a good idea of what worship is. And as I talk about the Bible definition of worship and how the Bible uses the term worship, I want you to, in your mind, consider what the world and what modern churches usually depict worship as and tell me if it matches, because I don't believe it does. And so as we look at 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 36, the Bible says, are you there? Are you there? It says in verse 36, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left in thine house shall come. And here's the word, crouch. What are they doing? They're crouching. But Why? shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and shall say, put me, I pray thee, into the priest's office that I may eat a piece of bread. Now, I'm not going to go into context on this with you for sake of time. I just want you to see how the word is used. The concept here is that the individual, let me put my my, uh, lapel mic on, is that the individual will, uh, will come before his presence and will crouch down begging for bread. That's what worship is. It's recognizing the supremacy of God or the supremeness of God or whatever the proper English word is. Recognizing who God is and who we are. We're just merely beggars before a great king. But praise God, he's a good king. And he doesn't treat us like beggars. But my station compared to his station, when I come before his presence, I come crouching down In humility, please, may I have a blessing. That's worship. Another way it's used is look at Numbers uh, in chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22. And I can already see this is not going to finish today, and that's okay with me. And I don't know if it's okay with you, but Numbers 22, verse 31 The Bible says, Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head, and here it is, and fell flat, fell flat on his face. And so here is Balaam riding his donkey, 
and his donkey isn't moving and he's beating on the thing. The donkey talks to him. You know, and whatnot. And, and finally, Balaam sees the angel of the Lord. And the Bible says he got off the donkey and he, he, he bowed down and fell flat on his face because he could not look at him. That, my friend, is what worship is. To fall flat on your face. Look at Second Samuel in chapter 2. Or rather, chapter 18. You can look at chapter 2, but I won't be there. Second Samuel, chapter 18. The Bible says in verse 28, And Ahimaaz called and said unto the king, All is well. Are we there? Because I still hear pages. All is well. And he, what's the next two words? Fell down. Fell down. This isn't, he didn't trip. You read the context, he fell down to the earth upon his face before the king. Now, I don't believe he was worshiping the king, but this same word is the word that's used when, when, he, when God uses the word worship. He fell down to the earth upon his face before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which have delivered up the men that lifted up their hand against my lord the king. He fell down to the earth upon his face. Look at Psalm 72. Psalm 72, and verse 11. In Psalm 72, and verse 11, it says, Yea, all kings shall, what's the next two words? Fall down, where? Before him. All nations shall serve him. Look at Isaiah 45, and verse 14. Isaiah 45, and verse 14. I'll give you a moment. All right, I'm going to go ahead and read. Thus saith the Lord, this is Isaiah 45, 14. Thus saith the Lord, the labor of Egypt and merchandise of Ethiopia and of the Sebians, men of stature shall come over unto thee and they shall be thine. They shall come after thee in chains. They shall come over and they shall fall down unto thee. They shall make supplication unto thee, saying, Surely God is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God. Again, they're not worshiping the people of Israel, but the word here, fall down, is the same word that's used 99 times in your Bible to say worship or worshiped or, or something along that line. And, uh, and so we see the idea of worship is this idea of adoration. We look to the English definition, the idea of, of, of seeing your worth compared to God's worth and to fall flat, prostrate, fall down, crouch before God. The uh, next time or the next Hebrew word that's used is the word abad. And that's word abad is 294 times in your scriptures, only five of them deal with the word worshiper, and that's always in reference to the worshipers of Baal in 2 Kings chapter 10. That's the only place you find the word abad with the word worshiper. They were worshipers of Baal. But what we learn from this, nonetheless, is that word by implication means to serve. In fact, 163 times that word is translated as served or served 61 times. Or to do something, or to, like for instance, tilling and tilling the ground is how that word is also used. Or, or the husbandman, or a laborer, or a bond service. And uh, five times he uses that word as someone who is a worshiper of Baal, which means they were servants of Baal, or they are people that served Baal. May I say to you that if the world in in Elijah's day and Jehu's day is able to serve Baal, surely God's people should be able to serve God. You say, I, I'm a worshiper. Okay, then that means you crouch down before God. That means you fall down prostrate before God. That means you honor Him and humble yourself before God. And it means you serve Him. You serve Him. All right, the next time we find this a Hebrew word translated as worshiper is the word astab. It's found 17 times in your Bible. Only once is the word worship. and um, But it means, strangely enough or interestingly enough, Every time you find it, except for that one time, it deals with this idea of displeasing, grieving, hurting, 
making to be sorry, vexing and so forth. And the one time you find it, you can actually look there if you'd like. It's in, um, actually, no, I don't. Well, you can if you want, but people online won't because I didn't put it in my, in the uh, live stream package. But in Jeremiah, I'm just going to read it. Jeremiah 44, verse 19. This is talking about the queen of heaven. They were, you understand the people of Israel were, were deep into idolatry. And, uh, and they were being questioned for it. And there was a question of whether or not the women were offering sacrifices or incense to the queen of heaven. And the men didn't know anything about it. And, uh, and the women basically spoke up and said, oh, no, they were there with us the whole time. But it says in verse 19 of Jeremiah 44, And when we burn incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes of wor uh, to worship her and pour drink offerings unto her without our men? And so they were questioning whether or not they actually did it without their men. And, and that's beside the point. But still we see the idea here. Uh, I'm just showing it to you, so I'm being, uh, what is the word I look for? Transparent. And so this word worship here is dealing with worshiping the queen of heaven, which uh, in modern day we could very well equate that to so-called Virgin Mary and uh, in the Babylonian day. And uh, anyway, uh, but here we see that 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 was a, a type of vexing. Uh, but but here's an interesting thing. It's also translated as rest, uh, not R-E-S-T, but W-R-E-S-T, which means to twist. And there's a very good chance that the type of worship that they were doing, this is a negative worship, you understand, grieving, vexing, but the type of worship they were doing dealt with an und, un, I can't say the word, undulating, is that the word? Is, 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 did I say it right? What? Undulating. Okay, to twist oneself. Okay, uh, to gyrate and whatnot, which does fit a lot of modern day worship services. All right, we'll move on. Then we find in the Old Testament, the remaining times that you find the word worship in the Old Testament or to be in the book of Daniel. And uh, we're not going to look at them, but I just want to talk to you about it. Now, the book of Daniel, this is actually written in the Chaldean Neo-Aramic language. You understand? Because they were in Babylon and whatnot. And uh, this word worship is only found 12 times and all of those times in the book of Daniel. And every single time this word is used, it's, it's translated as either worship, worship, or worshipeth. And basically, it's, it's taken from a Hebrew word, which is, okay, so the, the Chaldean word is the word sagid, which is taken from a Hebrew word, which is the word sagad. And it basically means to prostrate oneself, to bow down low. That's what worship is. As we move into the Gospels, we find that the word worship is found 34 times in 29 verses. And throughout Acts, through Revelation, the rest of the New Testament, it's found 46 times in 44 verses. The word worship in the Gospels, the Greek word, the most common one is the word proskune. That word is found 60 times in the Bible, and every time it's dealing with the word worship. And it means literally, and we talked about this before, to kiss one's hand or to lick a, like a dog licking his master's hand. It means to fawn or to crouch. It means to, to prostrate oneself in homage, to do reverence, to adore. And it's translated, as I said, to worship. And so when they worshipped or when the word worship was used and this particular word was used, the, the, the mindset, the imagery was to be like a dog sitting before its master, licking his master's hand. You understand that's what worship is. When you worship God, it's not jumping around and gyrating all over the place. It is a humble reflection of your relationship to a mighty God. Can there be a corporate worship? Can, is singing praises part of worship? Yes, it is. It is. And we're going to see that more next week than we are this week. Certainly. Can we, do we come together to worship and, and whatnot? Certainly we do. But I just want you to understand the majority of the time when you find the concept of worship in the Bible, it is a very personal, one-on-one, -on -one, genuflecting before the Lord, submitting and humbling yourself and sacrifice. We also find the Greek word sabome. Six of ten times it's translated as either worship, worship, or worshipeth. Again, it means to adore. In fact, the only other it's the only other four times it's found is three times the word devout and one time is the word religious. Then you have the word doxa. Now, most of you probably know what doxa is. 
For instance, we have in our song books a song called the doxology. All, uh, I can't remember how it goes now. It's not the all hail. Like, I can't remember it now. But anyways, but doxa, it, it means glory, right? And, uh, and so the word doxa means glory. And, uh, and, and of course, it's found, uh, I forgot to write it down, 170 some odd times. Only one time is the word worship. And I want you to see that one. If you take your Bibles and look at Luke in chapter 14 and verse 10, doxa. When you find the word doxa in your Bible, 147 times is the word glory, 10 times is the word glorious, 6 times is the word honor, 4 times is the word praise, 2 times is the word dignities, but this one time is the word worship, and I find it interesting, the word and its use here. But in Luke 14 and verse 10 it says, But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend... Go up higher, then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. Now, many of you know the story. This is a parable that Jesus is teaching, and he's trying to explain a point about not uh, being presumptuous and taking the higher seat and so forth. He tells the, the person at the, at the, that invited everybody, don't invite the people that you can only uh, gain from. Go invite people that you can't gain anything from. And he told the people sitting at the, this uh, festival, this party, if you will, don't take the highest seat and risk being moved to the lower seat and being shamed in front of everybody rather take the lower seat and and the possibilities you may stay at the lower seat but at least you're not shamed or they might come to you and ask you to sit at a higher seat and uh, and then you'll have he says worship again he's not saying that they're going to worship this man the word is doxa and it deals with the fact of he'll be praised he'll have glory and so what we can extrapolate from that is when we worship God, we are offering him glory. We are offering him praise. So, yes, praise and worship do go hand in hand. But I just remind you again that nine times out of ten, I just threw those numbers out of my hat. I don't even have a hat. But but majority of the time, it deals with this idea of falling prostrate, which, by the way, when you fall prostrate before the Lord, you are offering him glory and praise. Am I right? I want some response because I feel like I've lost everybody already. So everyone look up this way and slap your neighbor. Okay. <laughs> I said slap, not haul off and punch, Mrs. Henson. Wow. <laughs> anyway, I saw them out there and I said, how are you, how are the Henson's doing? She says she's getting stronger. And I said, so pretty soon you'll be able to beat your husband up again. She says, I'm looking forward to it. So anyway. All right. Yes, wicked. I know. I know. Go back to sleep. All right. <laughs> Then the, the next time we find uh, a word translated as worship in our Bible is the word theosobase. And that's the only time you find it. And it basically means to reverence of God or to be pious. A worshiper of God, in fact, is how it's, how it's translated. And then you have the word latreo, which I butchered. Uh, 22 times is found in the Bible, four of which is the word worship. Or actually three is worship and one is worshipers. Then you have the word yosebio. It's found twice in your Bible, once as piety and once as worship. Interestingly enough, the word piety means a veneration or a reverence of the supreme being, a love of his character. It means reverence of parents or friends. And so the interesting thing about this word is we actually find in Acts chapter 17. I want you to see it with me. Go to Acts chapter 17 and verse 23 specifically. Paul is speaking on Mars Hills. And uh, many of you know the story. He gets there and he sees all these temples and idols and so forth. And there's an idol for this thing and for that thing and the other thing. And then as or, or deity or what have you. And, you know, superstition. In fact, he calls them out on their superstition. You know, they had a they had a God for everything. They had a God for crops. They had a God for, you know, uh, that they can hang from the rearview mirror to keep them safe from the driving. You hear me? Saint whatever it is, you know, they had they had a God for this and a God for that. And, you know, just in case if we miss one, we have a temple or an altar to the unknown God. Right. And so Paul calls them out on it in verse 23 of Acts chapter 17. He says, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly, here's the word, worship him, declare I unto you. That word worship there is the word that deals with showing piety or reverence or obedience to. 
And he says, you ignorantly worship this unknown God. Now, I'll keep your place in Acts chapter 17 because the next one is going to be there too. It's very similar to the one we just read as, uh, as far as the, the Greek is concerned. It's the word, uh, let me see if I can find my notes again. It's the word therapeo, uh, therapio, therapio. Now, let me ask you a question. What English word sounds like what I just said? Therapio. Therapy. And that's very good. Because that word, therapio, uh, let's look at it first. It's verse 25 of Acts chapter 17. Now, at this point, he's preaching about God, the real God. And he says, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. That word therapio means to wait upon menially or to adore or specifically to relieve, like to relieve of a disease, to cure, to heal, to, to worship. In fact, 25 times in the Bible it's translated as the word healed. 10 times is the word heal. Uh, three times is the word cured. Three times is the word healing. And twice is the sing, uh, uh, present tense cure. And then this one time is worship. What is he saying? He says, God doesn't need your help. God doesn't need you to cure him or to heal him. He doesn't need your therapy. Rather, you need God's therapy. And then, as we move on, the next time we find a, a Greek word used to describe the word worship or translate the words worship is the word neokros. It's only found once in your Bible, and this is in reference to the people of Ephesus being worshippers of the goddess Diana. Then you have the sabad, sabad zome, also only found once in your Bible in Romans chapter 1 and verse 25 where it says, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. The interesting thing, that word means to venerate or to adore. And so certainly we're living in that day and age now, are we not? Where people are adoring the creature more than they adore the creator. We're more concerned about... Now listen, I don't think as a Christian we should just pollute for polluting's sake. And I think that we ought to be caretakers of this world that God has placed us in. And we ought to be wise stewards. But at the same time, I don't think you should go to the degree of being a tree hugger and you put more adoration in the creation than you do the one that created it all. And we have more adoration for animals than we do for God and more adoration for, for nature than we do for God. And God should be the one that is adored above all things. And so they worship, they adore the creature more than they did the creator. The last one I'm going to give you on this note is the word, well, I guess there's two more. Uh, one is the word thraskia, which is found once of four times being translated as worship. The other time is being translated as religion and so forth. It deals with the ceremonial observance. And then there is ethel of rakia, and uh, we will look at that one. That's Colossians chapter 2. And uh, this is dealing with a voluntary piety or sanctimony or to be sanctimonious in many respects. But Colossians chapter 2, and it's translated. And uh, if you read your Bible, if you read this in the English, it is a very strange phrase. But English, uh, English uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. Let's look at that. Colossians 2, verse 20. Are you there? It says, wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? And then it gives a parenthetical statement what he means by ordinances. Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using. And so he's talking a lot about the Jewish law in many respects, these ordinances, don't touch this, don't eat that, don't taste that. And all these things, when you use it, they just perish. They're not important things, he says. And uh, in fact, he goes on and says, now, not just the Jewish law. Let me rephrase that. You understand the Pharisees, they had a, a penchant for taking the law and then turning into something that even the law wasn't saying it was. They turned into commandments of men. We find a law of that in fundamentalism, too. And uh, but touch not, taste not, handle not, which are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. So we remove that parenthetical statement for a moment. We can understand what he's saying a little bit better because uh, the parenthetical statement just describes the ordinances. So let's remove that for a moment and read it. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances after the commandments and doctrines of men? He says, why are you allowing yourself to be subject to these things? And so this is not a good thing. 
You're saved from that. And so now he's going to explain a little bit. Verse 23, which things have indeed a show that's important, a show of wisdom. No, that makes you look wise, right? It's all about the outward appearance and what people assume of you. These things indeed have a show of wisdom in, what's the next two words? Will worship. Isn't that a strange phrase? Will worship. It doesn't say, and you will worship. It says it has a show in will worship. That's actually one word. That's the Greek word. I mean, one Greek word that we just mentioned. But the word is uh, in English is will worship. In other words, it's like worshiping of the will. Or, uh, as he goes on and says, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body. Notice, after the semicolon, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Basically, because I'm keeping these ordinances, touch not, handle not, taste not, I'm proving that I have self-discipline, and therefore I am, the negative side of it, he's saying, is you have will worship. You're worshiping your own self-discipline, basically. And so that's every time in the Old and New Testament we find the word, whether it be the Hebrew, the Chaldean, or the Greek. Now, why did I take time to take you through all that? To show you in general how the word worship is used. Some of it was a negative connotation, but every single positive connotation, every single time we see the word worship in the Bible, we find it is a falling down, prostrate, adoration, reverencing, honoring, serving it has nothing to do with working up some emotion. It has to do with the fact that the king walks into the room and you fall down in respect and honor to him. It has to do with the fact of you yielding your life over to him, submitting to his will. And as we saw in the very first instance of worship being used in Genesis chapter 22, we find that Abraham said, I'm going to go worship God. And in his mind, he knew at least he understood, based on the revelation he was given to that point, that he was going to sacrifice his son because God wanted it. That's worship. Understanding God would somehow make it all work out. Faith. That's worship. Am I opposed? Obviously not. But am I opposed to people getting together in church and, and shouting to the rooftops and singing the loudest and clapping and praising God and standing up and waving the Bible, stomping their feet? No, I'm not opposed to that. We're supposed to. But that's not necessarily worship. It's part of worship. But worship goes so much further than that. Worship, it's the adoration of God. Now, that's as far as I'm going to get this morning. So next week, we're going to take you through some scripture, not necessarily the word worship in every single one of these, but we're going to see how this worship, how this honor or adoration is to be directed toward God. And that's what we'll look at next week. For now, I'm closing down Sunday school. We'll see you in the next service. And God bless you.